I wearing USC too? Yeah, I actually, I wore my <laughs> USC to represent. <laughs> sure to get it. And I have my flag right there. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Melissa. I am a licensed clinical therapist with a private practice based in California. If you're new here, please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button for more. I post videos every single Wednesday and Sunday. Today I'm really excited because I am going to be interviewing Denise, who is a fellow Trojan. She currently is in the MSW program at USC, which I attended exactly a decade ago. And so I'm really excited to learn more from her. Her. and if you're interested in learning about her journey throughout this pandemic and kind of what to look forward to in school and in work um, stay tuned so thank you and welcome back to my youtube channel for those that are new which is probably everybody uh, i want to introduce a really special guest to my channel and her name is denise i'm really excited to have denise in this video because she is a fellow usc -er. she's in um, the msw program in her second year and she's finishing up and she has an amazing instagram um page and so I'm hoping that you can all take a look at it because she puts out a lot of inspirational posts and a lot of facts about mental health and she's also um, involved in a lot of family and children's services and school social work which is different than um, the type of social work that I do and so I'm really excited to hear more about that. So thank you so much Denise for agreeing and um, deciding to come on and share more of your story. I'd like to hear more from you. Is there anything that you'd like to share that I've left out? Yeah, so I'm currently in my last semester of USC's MSW program. I do have a concentration in children, youth, and families. And my first year I did, I was able to get my PPSC hours done to be able to work in the school setting as a school social worker. And this year I am interning as a therapist in the community mental health under the Department of Mental Health. So it's been really exciting and thank you for having me. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit of, uh, about some of the experiences of being in graduate school right now, but I'm really interested to hear more about like how um, your practicum and how classes are uh, being developed right now or are even just taking place amidst this pandemic. So yeah, how is that? Because when I was in school in 2010, so to whoever's watching that was like a decade ago but basically when I was in school everything was in person we didn't have there I think there was a, a very small uh, group of students that were experimenting it was the first year I think in 2010 that they had just opened up the online portion of MSW school but there was literally just a dozen people in it everybody else in my program at the time was going to school in person and doing their practicum in person and so things have changed in this world and so tell me a little bit about how they're doing things right now for you yeah so I'm an on-campus student, so I started off my first year being all on campus. My classes were in person, my internship was in person, and then obviously the pandemic hit around March, so then we moved online, and we've been online ever since. And the beauty about it is that they have developed a really good, it's called the Virtual Academic Center, so they've developed a really good online MSW program. So it wasn't like a new thing for the professors. They knew how to like navigate it and all that. It was just a struggle for the students, the on-campus students, because we were so used to that in-person interaction and doing our role plays in person and the vignettes in person and all that. And then now, now we're just like, okay, where everything is through Zoom. And so they kind of adopted the virtual platform onto us, which at first was like a huge adjustment because we weren't used to it. And on the virtual platform, what they do is that they do asynchronous work as well. So this is work that you have to do basically like before coming to class, which is a bunch of like these lecture videos and obviously your readings as well. But the lecture videos I was pretty impressed with because they were really well developed. It's literally like the professor giving a lecture and you just watch the video and there's a PowerPoint and it's really professional and all of that. And it's very informative. 
but we've never done asynchronous work before. It was literally just, we go to class, like we obviously do our readings and then we come to class and we get the lecture and then we go home, we do our assignments and whatever. But now it's like, we had to do this asynchronous work as well. And so that was a huge adjustment for all of us. A lot of us um, had our concerns over that and we would reach out to the administration about that because we were just like, this is a lot, like we're not used to this. Like now we have to do the synchronous, which is being on Zoom for the lecture and we have to do the asynchronous on top of it. So it was a lot at first. Now I've kind of adjusted to it and I really do appreciate it because it is a lot of extra like information and knowledge that we can utilize ourselves. And we kind of just come to class and we're kind of just prepared. Like we're ready to discuss, we're ready to role play, we're ready to practice the skills and stuff like that, which is really, which is really cool, but it was different. So it was a huge like transition for us to do that. But luckily our professors were super understanding like they literally would start the class and be like, you know what, we know this isn't what you guys signed up for. Like you guys signed up for on campus learning, you guys signed up to be in the classroom. So they were very lenient on us with that. And then as far as field, some of the students are still doing in-person work, but as for me, my internship is completely online. Everything is telehealth. Um, even our like trainings, everything, we don't even step foot into the office or nothing like that. We're community mental health, so we're supposed to be going into their homes to delivering services, but that's not allowed right now. So it's just all been through Zoom. And at first it was kind of tricky and it was kind of hard and whatnot, but I've actually learned to really like telehealth. I actually enjoy it a lot. And I like I'm sure you've seen it on my Instagram, but I do the virtual therapy rooms and I love it so much and it's been so much fun and like my agency also asked me to like create some for them so that other therapists can use as well. So I've really enjoyed the the doing that the therapy rooms telehealth and whatnot, but we're my agency is in the process of all getting vaccinated so we're hoping that. By the time we graduate, we at least get to meet our clients in person like one or two times. So it's looking good, I guess. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about the emotional uh, library or social emotional library that you posted. Is that kind of what you were referring to when you talked? Yes, about it? yes. So I have that. I created that basically for my agency because they wanted a social emotional library. So I created that for them. But um, I'm doing math in my agency and our focuses are anxiety, depression, disruptive behavior and trauma. So they really wanted us to create like different rooms that focus on those things. So I have an anxiety room where I have like different things like games, books, a lot of children's books because there's so many read alouds on YouTube, a lot of like relaxation techniques, psychoeducation, that kind of stuff. And then I also have a trauma room and then I just have like a relaxation room, a coping skills room, that kind of stuff. So when you say room, like what does that entail? Oh, so that's that's basically like a different slide. So I have like a bunch of like Google slides and I have them all on the thing and I just call it Denise's therapy room, but I have like an anxiety slide, like a trauma slide, and then there's like my social emotional library. Oh, okay. So you really give options for what it is that like your client may be dealing with. Yeah, yeah. And it's so like convenient too, because it's like, I kind of have all my resources in there. So it's not like I have to be scrolling through my laptop trying to look for a certain book or trying to look for a certain like intervention and stuff like that. Like it's all there. So it's just so organized and convenient to just like, oh, it's here. Let me pull it out and share my screen on Zoom or Sometimes I can even send them the link and they'll share their screen on Zoom and they'll like do the activities and whatnot. Oh, okay. So you're able to really collaborate with them um, just even based on like virtual technology. It doesn't have to be in person anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I think that was like, the scariest part for me with doing telehealth because last year I was all in person was how am I going to engage the client like they're going to be so out of it, especially because they've been on zoom for like probably six hours already because they're in school and I'm meeting them after school. So I'm like, how am I going to engage them. How am I going to keep them looking at the screen and stuff like that. So that's been really helpful. And I think that's one of the reasons why I haven't been struggling as much during like the whole shift to online therapy and all that. 
So what is the main age group that you work with? So it could literally, and with my agency, it could be anyone from literally zero to adults because we also serve um, the caregivers of the children that are in treatment. Mm -hmm. So right now in my caseload, I have like elementary school age, I have high school and adults as well. Oh, okay. So, wow. So you um, have uh, experience now uh, with working with like literally like infants all the way to adulthood. So yeah. do you find that more challenging that you have like such a, um, a wide range of different ages as opposed to like, because I was under the impression that you just worked with kids instead of having just like that specialization with a specific age, like you have such a, a wide array. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was challenging at first because last year I was working at a middle school and a high school. So I was used to that. And so when I got the elementary school age kids, I was like, oh my God, like I'm scared. They're not going to understand anything that I'm saying and stuff like that. But I actually really, really enjoy working with them as well. And I feel like it's going really well. And I think my, my therapy virtual rooms helps a lot with them too. And then I think the scariest part for me was working with adults because I've never done that before. And I came into the program only wanting to work with kids. I never, ever thought that I was going to work with adults, but I'm actually really enjoying that as well. And even just working with caregivers of the kids, of my kids that are clients, that has been really that has been a really good experience for me as well. And that was something that was out of my comfort zone too, because I've never really worked with caregivers before. Mm -hmm. So I've really this internship has really just broadened my scope and I'm really thankful for that. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that because, you know, it's interesting that you say that. I had kind of had a similar experience. So when I was at USC in the program, I had only wanted to work with kids myself, like only school age, like elementary, probably pre-K or kindergarten age kids, like not even anything really beyond second grade. And then my first placement was in a middle school. And um, then I heard later on that a, a bunch of like different students had mentioned that they heard that the one of the goals of the practicum for the faculty there was to place students in places that they, the opposite of the population they wanted to work with. Did you hear about that too? Or was that kind of like a myth that was going on? <laughs> I did not hear of that at all, but I've heard of other schools doing that, which I thought was like, whoa, like, why didn't they do that with us? Because with us, it was just like, for our first year, they made us fill out like a questionnaire of where we want to be placed. And then they like placed you there. And then second year is when you had to go through the whole interview process and picking whichever places you wanted to interview at and all of that. So yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah. So the first year when I was there, they they asked me about places that we wanted to um, work in, like what populations and things like that. But nobody, everybody kind of got placed in the opposite type of <laughs> practicum that they wanted. And so, but then the second year you, you interview for the practicum and then the inter internship that you want. And then whoever takes you, you know, you're able to, to get it that way. But first year was way different. And I, I don't know if they changed it now, but I heard the reason that they do that is because they really wanted people to have the opportunity to work with different populations and really open their mind as opposed to just yeah. having, you know, this one set population to work with and then not be open to working with any population. So it was interesting because working in the middle school when I only wanted to work with like pre-K and K, it gave me the opportunity to work with a lot of the faculty too and with the parents of the middle schoolers and stuff and then I realized that I maybe I think I'm going to work more with like the older population which was the exact opposite of when what I thought yeah. I would work with starting in school so that's really interesting I'm curious to know with you too uh, is there a reason why you chose USC did you choose any other schools well when I first started like searching for grad schools and stuff well Honestly, USC's program appealed to me first, just because, so when I was an undergrad, I majored in public health. Mm -hmm. So at first, when I was looking into grad school, I was looking into public health programs. And then I came across um, the MSW program because there's a dual degree with public health and mm -hmm. the MSW program. So that's how I found the MSW program. And mm -hmm. 
well, specifically USC's MSW program. And then I went into looking into all of that. I looked into all the concentrations they had and everything. And I really was just like, whoa, like this is like has everything that I want because in undergrad, what I was really doing was more macro work, like more macro mental health work. Mm -hmm. And I really, really, really liked that. And I really thought that, okay, that's where I'm headed towards. But then I started working at a school and I was working with students individually. And that's when I was like, I kind of want to work like one on one with kids as well, too. So when I discovered the MSW program, I was just like, wow, you can really do both. Mm -hmm. So I really saw that it, I literally tell my friends this too, where I'm just like, I feel like God created this program just for me because it has like everything that I wanted. It had like the PPSC, because I know a lot of schools don't offer the PPSC. They either like, you have to get it after, like do an extra year, pay more money and that kind of stuff. So I really, really like that. And then just like by doing research, like I was, I love LinkedIn. So I'm always on LinkedIn and I'm always like looking up people on LinkedIn. And like everyone that I was finding was like, they graduated from USC, got their MSW at USC. And even like I was researching like the, cause at Cal State LA we had um, counseling and psychological services. So I was researching all the counselors and it would show you where they got their degrees. And it was like MSW from USC, MSW from USC. And I was like, okay, so this program has to have something if everyone's going here, like it has to be good. And so I think that's what really appealed me to that program. I did look into other ones. I was just going to, I was going to apply to USC and Cal States as well, but USC was always my number one choice. Hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. there was all, it seems like kind of what we we're talking about earlier, just like having yeah. that network, people having that Trojan network really was appealing to you. Yeah. And it ended up like, I mentioned that earlier, it ended up being like greater than I even expected because mm -hmm. I didn't even realize like they had, they have a lot of scholarship opportunities. Like mm -hmm. they literally, like when you get in, they send you like this whole thing of different scholarships you can apply to based off of like the population you want to work with and what setting you want to work with and all that. And like, they just have so much, they have stipend programs too, to offer you. And then also they have a lot of organizations that you could join to network as well. There's like over, I think, 10 caucuses that you can join. So that also appealed to me too, because I was very involved in undergrad and I knew like, okay, grad school is only two years. So I want to do as much as I possibly can to enjoy that experience. So I'm really happy that I was able to like get involved and like just take advantage of all the opportunities they had to offer. Yeah, I know you talk a lot about like the school social work and you know, we're big on acronyms and everything, but for those that don't know what the PPSC is, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's basically the, just like teachers get a credential, this is like the credential that you have to get to work in a school setting as well. So it goes for school counselors, school social workers, and school psychologists. And this credential, I believe, is only for the state of California. So it's the credential that you have to get if you want to work in the school setting. Hmm. And if you don't have that as a part as your program, then you have to get it outside, correct? There are certain schools that don't offer it. So I think I give that advice to a lot of people who ask me about MSW programs. Like if you do want to go into the school setting, make sure that it's a part of the program and make sure that you don't have to do an extra year because sometimes they'll make you do an extra year versus just counting it towards your two years, one of your years, you do the hours for it. So just making sure that it's a part of the program. So, you know, you save time and you save money and you just get it done right then and there. Did that go under a certain concentration for you? So do you guys have a concentration now? Because when I was in school, there were five concentrations. There were um, COPA, so that's community planning. That's like uh, more macro work. There was health, mental health. So I was a health concentration. There's mental health, school and families. And then there was work and life, which was for those that wanted to be like in HR and stuff like that. So oh, wow. last I heard, because I was a field instructor a year and a half ago to um, actually a USC um, MSW student. And she said that they were completely different. I don't remember what she said that they are now, but what are the concentrations like now? Yeah, so we only have three now, and it's the one I'm in, so children, youth, and families, and then we have adult mental health, and then we have the macro one, which is social change and innovation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, too, if you had uh, advice 
to give to somebody that wants to apply to an MSW program, like especially in our current state right now amidst this like, pandemic. I mean, hopefully things will get better. All we can do is hope because, you know, the vaccines are coming out and being distributed now. What would you say or what advice would you give to somebody that's kind of like caught in the middle of wanting to apply, but not quite sure because things just look so different right now. And as social yeah. workers and mental health and behavioral health providers, we are so like in the community, right? Like it's mm -hmm. great that we have telehealth, but the origins of social work were really doing community work and going out into these actual yeah. neighborhoods and communities and developing relationships that way. And so this is much different in this world. So what would you say to somebody that is kind of like, doesn't know what to, to do? You know, it's funny because we were just talking about that in class of how like we're in this whole new world now of social work and how like our professors were telling us like, you know, like you guys are getting kind of like the experience of a lifetime because we got the whole in-person thing last year. And now it's like, we're really being taught to be a, a social worker in a whole different world like you know this world of being online and all that and I think like the advice I would give is that you know like as as a social worker I really think you need to be flexible you need to be able to adapt because you know you never know what's going to happen even like in crisis situations and stuff like that you need to be able to just work with what you got and work fast and stuff like that so I would just tell them like you know like I know it's kind of discouraging because this isn't the experience that you would have wanted, but you know, like the way I see it is that I am so thankful that I still get to help people. Like, even though it's online, even though it wasn't my preferred method, like I would have rather met clients face to face. I'm so grateful to still be able to help people and still meet with my clients every week online. And so I would just kind of give them that sense of like you know you're still going to be making a difference and you're still going to be learning a lot because it's like my professors keep saying I don't know if it's true or not that this is the way of the future that telehealth is going to be the new biggest thing so they're always telling us like you guys are getting the training of a lifetime because you're learning how to navigate telehealth so I would just make it as positive and as real as I possibly can like you know it's not it's probably not going to be what you wanted what you expected but you're still learning how to make a difference and I know a lot of people talk about how they're not learning anything during this whole pandemic that online school is terrible but for me in my experience I feel like we still are learning we're still growing every single day and it's like it amazes me how much we're able to do just from sitting at our desk at home like how much we're able to learn how much we're able to help others and it's like even though you're still confined to like your desk at home or wherever it is that you're working from you're still making a difference and you're still growing and you're still learning and you know you'll still go through your program you'll graduate and even if nothing changes with COVID and everything like you'll still be out there making a difference and then hopefully one day when things do change you'll be able to get that as well. So I wouldn't tell them like, I know some people will be like, oh, just wait, wait till everything's back to normal and then do it. But I still feel like we're still making a big impact and we're still learning a lot. So I would still encourage them to apply. Yeah, that's really good advice. I mean, I think that it, it's really hard. You know, I hear that too a lot that people are like, just wait, what, whatever it may be, whether it be school or something else related to personal professional development. Um, I've heard a lot of like, just wait until things calm down. Um, yeah. But with everything that we have going with technology and virtual health, that those are always good ways to kind of substitute for what's lacking in person. So it's interesting to hear, you know, that encouragement and advice from somebody that's going through it both like in academia and actually professionally too, because you have the best of both worlds. Like in this very special time, you're doing online school and you're doing online work because that's what you do in your internship is like work. And so um, it's interesting to hear that perspective. So thank you so much for sharing and for really giving like your input and you're sharing your experiences about how you know, you're going through this, again, very special time. One question that I almost forgot is, how are you managing, like, personally? I know that we've talked a lot about, like, school and um, internship-wise. How are you managing, though, personally with what's going on? 
I have literally self-cared like no other this year. Like I know they're always preaching to us, self-care, 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 but that was something I never really listened to. I was just like, eh, whatever. But literally since the pandemic started, since online school started, I was like, nope, I have to self-care. I have to take my breaks and I have to like actually eat my lunch and that stuff. So this year, I really worked on like setting boundaries when it comes to my school and my work and everything and really like trying to figure out how to disconnect because that was a struggle for me too because like I said, everything I do, I do in this room. I go to school in this room, I work in this room and my room used to be like my safe place where I could just come home, relax, like lay on my bed and now it kind of triggers me because I'm just like, oh my God, I have work to do. So I really had to like just find ways to disconnect, like let everything go from the day and just relax. And that's something that I I really learned about myself this past year is just self-care. Like you need to self-care. Like you can't make excuses to not self-care. Like even if it's just five minutes, just breathing, just closing my eyes because Zoom gets too much. Like I really, really had to just pick it up in that department. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think with everything, I mean, technology can really bring us together, but because we're so reliant on technology right now, I think that people aren't really like talking about how stimulating always looking at a screen is, is like we're all like, even right now, (laughs) instead of having obviously an in-person session or interview, we're doing this over Zoom. And then the same thing with our clients and with you with school and everything. And so when we do have downtime, we don't recognize that, you know, looking at a TV screen is going to continue to keep that brain activity of stimulation going. And so like you said, to your point, like just being able to maybe close your eyes and do some mindfulness and something that maybe is away from the bed (laughs) a little bit. And so, yeah, thanks for that advice because I think that that's really important. And in closing, uh, because I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but again, I think that like the content that you put out is so special. And one of the things that you had wrote in one of your posts was that, so I'm going to Uh, just read it off of one of your posts. I wanted to work more closely with children and youth that are struggling with their mental health, experiencing trauma and living with different mental health disorders. Social work was the field that was able to bring everything I love into one. And you talked about that. I'm grateful for this profession because it emphasizes all we do for our clients, not just the micro level but mezzo and macro as well. And I think that you verbalized that and articulated that so well about the social work profession because there's there are other mental health professions out there. What I do love about social work that kind of sets it apart from the other mental health or behavioral health professions is that we do clinical work, but we also do, like you said, the mezzo and macro work, which involves a lot more of policy, community organization, and mezzo is kind of in between the clinical individual work and then the macro policy work. So maybe like a group uh, type of practice or like a couple's type of practice in, in therapy. And so I really thought that that post did a really good job at like summarizing our profession in a sense. So I really appreciate you sharing um, what you did share. And so can you tell us how to find your Instagram? Yeah. Yeah, So my Instagram is at pretty little mind and then it's two underscores. Yeah, I love that. I think that's such a cute name. Yeah, I know. I thought of it because like, because I want to work with kids. So I'm like, they have pretty little minds, you know, and I want to shape little minds. So yeah, that's so great. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, Denise, and all that you had to share. I think that it was really helpful to me, even just learning about how like the MSW program is shaped right now. And just learning more about you and your experiences was really special. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Yeah. If you enjoyed watching that video, thank you so much for joining us. Please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button for more content. Until then, managing mental health matters. <laughs> <laughs>